had nothing to do with the properties of electricity or the, the, the fundamentals of construction, but it was a terrific answer. Uh, the, the problem was that his worldview simply didn't accommodate his drawing of a conclusion that was accurate. I want to just briefly address agreement versus understanding as we deal with the very important element of charity this weekend. Uh, I, anyone who has known me very long knows that I'm frequently wrong but seldom without an opinion. And I, I, will, I will definitely be sharing opinions with you tonight. I'll be uh, giving you my thoughts and my perspective on true charity, on counterfeit charity, on how government operates and how we should operate apart from government. Uh, but I, I believe that as, as Christians, as believers, our, our goal should not be so much to prove ourselves right as to seek to be right. And so I think as we, as we work through these issues and listen to the speakers this weekend, uh, that that's the goal that we should all strive for, is to seek to be right more than seek to, to be the one who is right. Charity never fails. True charity never fails. Everyone that knows chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, where Paul assures us that charity, ne charity never fails, is familiar with that term. We've grown accustomed to just substituting love for charity, but I suggest that these verses of charity, possibly better than any other uh, phrase, help define a worldview especially a worldview that helps us determine what's true charity and what's counterfeit charity. Explains why government programs, although they may occasionally produce po some positive results, are nonetheless counterfeit and will fail in the end. Counterfeit is an attempt to look like something authentic when it has not the substance or the impact of what is authentic. There's a saying, a, kind of a modern proverb that my wife likes, and it is everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is humorous, but it's also profound in the context of charity. How much, much must my thinking change to understand char whether charity is genuine or not? I believe that that expression, that proverb, modern proverb, if you please, captures that difference. First of all, we have to begin, we have to learn to think biblically. We have to acquire a biblical view of life. And then we have to see charity as a part of life, not as an interruption to life. The scriptures tell us that the poor will always be with us. The poor are a part of life. Certainly, prosperity raises the poor out of poverty, and that's what I believe we need to be striving for. I believe God's word tells us that prosperity is a blessing, and that when we work towards prosperity, we are solving the problem of the poor, but the scriptures assure us that the poor will always be with us. The poor is a part of life, and we need to begin to look at it not as an interruption, but as a part. What's the nature of charity? Nature of charity is everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. In other words, charity never fails. If it looks like charity has failed, we're not at the end. Then there's something else to do. There's another step. There's another way to address the issue at hand. Someone once said that leadership, true leadership, is not always doing the right thing. It's always doing the thing that's right. It's responding to every decision with another decision. And that's what true charity is about. That's why it never fails, because it never quits until we achieve success. There's a difference between relief and accomplishment, between escape and victory, such as this distinction between the human and the divine, between the mind of man and the mind of Christ. Human perspective is the here and now. It is that which I calculate or forecast. It's limited by my resources and defined by my abilities. It's focused on statistics and defined by achievement. The divine perspective is focused on relationships and measured in character development. 
One might take time, the other demands commitment. The first has a schedule and often an expiration date. The other doesn't end until success is achieved. One is an activity and the other an end product. One is satisfied with satisfying a dependency, the other only with developing independence, freedom. What's the structure of the divine design? Once again, everything, if, if everything will turn out in the end. If it's, not, if it's not okay, it's not the end. Only in the realm of the divine does charity have a place. Why is it better for a man to share than to hoard, to give than to receive, to encourage rather than condemn? Is it because I think so or you think so? What's the base, on what basis do we have for claiming that charity is good? The, just, the justification for that view is simply the acknowledgement of a divine plan where all men are assigned some accountability for each other's welfare. Within the context of a divine plan, there's a purpose in charity. I am my brother's keeper. Re re resolution, relationship, direction, vision, all become elements of success and integral to true charity. All things do work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. That's that we might be successful, conformed to the image of Christ. There is no better price, no, no better picture of success. Back to the worldview. We have to have a biblical worldview. Life, it really isn't a race. It's a course. If we go to that passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, excuse me, chapter 4 and verse two, 7, Paul says, I have finished the course. I fought a good fight. I have finished the course. He doesn't say I've finished the race. He says I've finished the course. If life is like a race, then I can help others in a, in a, a hurdles race by just taking the hurdles out of the way. If I want to make it easier, if I want to get them more successful, I just start pulling hurdles. But that's not the point. Because the hurdles is set up for a certain type of race and it's set up for a certain time frame and we time that race. The hurdles is not a good illustration of the course of life. It's not a race, it's a course. An accurate worldview prepares us for a proper role in true charity and helps us recognize the counterfeit. Life is not a race, it's a course, like an obstacle course. If you consider, some of you have run obstacle courses. The military uses them pretty faithfully and they use them for a reason. And they design the obstacles on purpose. The obstacles aren't there to hinder their progress. The obstacles aren't there really even to divide one recruit from another. They're really designed to unite those recruits together. Because every obstacle has been designed by people who know what might be faced on the battlefield. And they design the obstacles so when that young soldier has to face his first fire fight, he's prepared by having gone through obstacles before. Were it not for that training, we, many would never survive that first battle. Our God knows the fights that are ahead of us. He knows the challenges that we'll face. He knows the questions we'll have to answer. He knows the discouragement that we, we, under which we might under what, whose attack we might come. And God prepares the obstacles in life so that we won't go in to life unprepared. On an obstacle course, every obstacle has purpose and design. Its purpose is not to interrupt or delay. It's not to harm or tear down, but to build up and prepare for what's ahead. New recruits don't know war. If they wait until they face the enemy to learn the endurance and skills needed, most will not survive. The ultimate accomplishment of an obstacle course is not to divide those who run it, but to unite them. Though they may be timed to provide incentive, the purpose is not in the speed, but in the completion. Each obstacle is its own challenge. Each is designed to equip for a specific type of encounter and the combination of challenges equals a course. Trials are a part of life. If there is a sovereign and gracious God, then each trial or obstacle has purpose and is designed for my good, but that good is only realized 
in its completion, not in escaping it. Worldview of synopsis. Obstacles are what turn time into life. Wouldn't life be boring? Were there no trials? Were there no challenges? Were there, was there no resistance? I believe that God has designed obstacles in, in my life so that I won't just be killing time in this world. Who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Obstacles turn time into life. What's the purpose of true charity? The purpose of true charity, and I think we've already heard it tonight, is success. That's the purpose of charity. It's not relief, it's success. It's success in family. It's success in finances. It's success in education, in career, in, char in character, in every aspect of life. As overcomers, a New Testament description of successful Christian living we welcome every obstacle as a friend because God's word tells us to. Welcome trials as friend. And allow it to become our preparation for what lies ahead. Without obstacles, there is no overcoming. Here's a partial list of the purposes of true charity. We can look at this in exasperation, cry, that's impossible. That is true for counterfeit charity because it's program-based. But true charity is relationship-based, not program-based. The results of true charity are not measured in the number served, but in changed lives. That's the only legitimate goal of charity. A natural question might be, why not just make government programs relationship-based? Some might even say that they are relationship-based because government-paid social workers, especially the good ones, have a relationship with all their clients. We'll address that and look a little bit at it tomorrow as we examine the structure behind true charity and government programs, which I'll call counterfeit charity. But for now, I'm suggesting that the objective and product of true charity is personal, personal success, not subsidized failure. And there is a difference. Tomorrow, we'll contrast the jurisdictions for delivering charity and we'll examine which are aligned with the purposes of charity. In preparation for tomorrow, I'd ask you to think about a principle that I believe is biblical and does help us to understand and apply true charity. If you want to change the world, you begin with a child. Thank you, and I'll be glad to answer questions or turn it back over to James. Charlie. Just a brief question. In your third or fourth slide, one of the slides, you talk about changing uh, our minds. I think the vast majority of the people here are, are Christians. Uh, if not Christians, at least more. <coughs> so, uh, how do we get to the point where we change the minds of those that are on the, the receiving end uh, rather than necessarily just on the, the giving and the providing end? Or is that something? No, probably, it's probably not a big part of tomorrow. Um, you know, there, there are two things I think we have to remember. One is to be swift to hear and slow to speak. I think that's a very important part of how you change other people's minds. We sometimes, as, as believers, we, we know we've got the right answers. I mean, we always don't have all the right answers. We, always have, we don't always know the scriptures well enough, but, uh, but we know that the scriptural answers are right, and so we, we tend to want to preach <laughs> and tell people the truth. But if we look at the example of Christ in the scriptures, he, he only really preached once. Uh, most of the other encounters that he had in scripture, he always asked questions. Uh, I, someone once said that asking questions is like feeling around the edge of a china plate for the crack. Uh, we're looking for what it is that will reach the heart, will unblind the mind that the God of this world has blinded uh, in the hearts of in the, in unbelievers and we'll find that crack and then be able to address it with truth. But I, I believe that the, the, the way you change people's minds is by asking them questions. The, the truth is that no, no answer from the God of this world is ultimately true. It's always a lie. 
our job as Christians is, answer, is ans asking enough questions to expose the lie. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And all of you have had conversations like that. You may not have thought of them that way at the time, but, uh, but you will uh, as you begin. I mean, if you haven't practiced that, as you begin to listen and ask questions, uh, to, to seek understanding. And, you know, that's, I think as, as believers, if we really do believe, it's all about relationships. You know, our relationship with God and our relationships with one another then the way you explore and build those relationships is by learning about another person, not just telling them about yourself. And, and that's hard because we all, we all like talking about ourselves. I mean, that's, that's who we are. But, but the mind of Christ will direct us differently than that. I don't know if that helps or not. Yes, sir. Um, while I would never be so foolish or arrogant as to limit our God, and it was brought up earlier with the Victor that scriptures tell us David slew Goliath because God was on his side but to your your point of the counterfeit charity since there is so many that depend on that fallacy and that falsehood of that counterfeiting to, to continue how can we as such a small group ever hold back that, that mighty tide of all of those people who have a vested financial interest in perpetuating that counterfeit charity We'll, we'll talk about that tomorrow, okay. but if you want to change the world, you start with a child. <laughs> but we, I, will, I will talk to that tomorrow. Other questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate your attention.